the Holy Gospel is written in that according to St. Matthew, chapter 9, beginning to read at verse 35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the labourers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned the twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon the Canaanite and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, Give without payment. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May I speak in the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Christians know that through the work of God in Christ, which has been made real to us through the Holy Spirit, the world is a different place. We are, to use Paul's famous phrase, justified by faith, and only by faith, not by anything we have done. So what does that feel like, and what does that really mean? If you read Romans chapter 4, that's the one before the reading for this morning, you find a very long and complex theological explanation based on the absolute faith of Abraham, explaining that this is not a new venture in God's relationship with us, but is in fact the way God has always dealt with us. He who believes in me shall never die, we read. Just by believing and trusting in God, we are in a right relationship with him. So what else does it mean to be justified by faith? According to Paul, it feels like the end of a war. We are at peace with God, putting him at the heart of all that we do. Peace for Paul isn't just a feeling, but a real change. He has known what it's like to be at war with God, fighting against what he knew at some level deep down, was God's work in Jesus. Paul had known what it was to be an uneasy truce with God, trying to do God's will but failing over and over again. Peace with God is knowing that you are on the same side as God forever, knowing that whatever you do or fail to do, you are ever at peace with God and with God's kingdom. So the main characteristics of a justified Christian, according to Paul, is not a serene, I'm all right, folks, smile, but hope. Your spiritual passport is stamped nationality, Christian. And you know that that is the equivalent of saying nationality, alive. And this relationship with God and God's kingdom isn't ours by right of birth or marriage or residence, but because of what God has done for us and by God's deciding through his infinite love that we are his people. 
And this puts a huge responsibility on our shoulders, not to let him down by the way we act and behave and speak. Thy kingdom come. We pray it every day, don't we? And there is still so much to be done. The harvest is plentiful, says Jesus, but the labourers are few. So go, he instructs the disciples, now called apostles, people who are sent. Go. No ifs or buts. Just go and proclaim the good news to the lost sheep. First the lost sheep of Israel, then later to the world. Tell them that the kingdom of heaven has indeed come near. Not a kingdom of territory and frontiers, but a kingdom of love and mercy, accessible to everyone who yearns for it. The gates are open wide. In that gospel reading, Jesus was particularly moved by the people's need for hope and for healing, which is why he sent the twelve out on their first solo mission. And from this, we begin to see that discipleship is a calling. It's a life of grace. Christ has called us too, and we follow him rooted in his divine love. We can say that our discipleship is an outcome of God's ongoing mission as he reaches out to make us his own. Those words, follow me, still echo down the years. God's kingdom is love, mercy, forgiveness, reconciliation and peace. The promise God makes anew to each generation. The fulfilment of God's covenant. The kingdom's gates are wide open for those who seek it. It's not bound to this earth any more than we are. And if the crowds at Jesus' time were like sheep without a shepherd, the people of our world are hardly any less fearful and anxious. Two thousand years may have come and gone, but the human heart hasn't changed all that much. Our communities are still fractured by mistrust and suspicion, by violence and war which tear us apart. Diversity among different peoples doesn't seem to bring joy at the wonder of God's work in us, but becomes stumbling blocks. To understanding and harmony. And yet, you know, in the midst of all this, the kingdom has come near to each of us. Just think of the outpourings of love and generosity and practical help we have seen in the aftermath of the start of that dreadful war in Ukraine, in all the tragedies that come across us in life these days. People of all nationalities and religions coming together in adversity, to pray together, to work together, to try to relieve some measure of distress. The kingdom of God has come near to us. The harvest is indeed full and ready to be gathered in. So many people yearning to come to Christ, often without realising it themselves. And as that Ethiopian ruler said to Philip in the Gaza desert that day, how can I understand what it's all about unless someone explains it to me? It is up to us to do the explaining. I wonder where you think the fields are ripe to receive the spiritual nourishment that comes from God. We may not be able to physically go to cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers and cast out demons. But we, who are justified and at peace with our Lord, through our faith, we can pray. We can pray that the lost sheep of our world will indeed come to love and acknowledge our Lord and Saviour. May it be our daily prayer. Father, may thy kingdom come. Um, amen. Let us pray. 
On this day, Father's Day, we pray for all fathers across the world. Lord, give them wisdom, patience, and the ability to love in a way that reflects your love. We remember those fathers who are separated from their children by war, and those in search of employment, and those who have abandoned their children. Lord, help them to keep the channels of conflict open so each child will know his or hers father's love. We pray for new fathers or expectant fathers. Lord, support them in their new responsibilities. Give them strength to accommodate the new routines and to be flexible in their approach. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Mighty God, we pray for all those in power over peace or war. Give them wisdom and compassion in their decision making, so weapons are laid down and peace reigns over the disputed lands. We especially remember and pray for the peoples involved in the Ukraine-Russia conflict, Sudan, Myanmar and others, and those living under oppressive regimes, including the people of North Korea. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Lord, we pray for all those who are hungry and do not know where their next meal is coming from. Be with those who cannot afford to feed their families properly, both in this country and worldwide. Support those people who are finding it difficult to grow the crops they need to live because of persistent flooding, drought, or other natural disasters. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving Lord, be near to all those who are sick. Give strength to those who are in pain. Surround those who are frightened with your tenderness. Give patience to those who are recovering and hold the weak in your loving arms. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, hear us as we pray for those who have recently died. May they find peace and contentment in the kingdom of God. Today, we especially remember the three people who died in Nottingham earlier this week. We remember those who are mourning a loved one and we ask you to surround them, Lord God, with your continuing compassion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We finish our prayers by saying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who are trespassing against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. How sweet the sound 
that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved.